take it away. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so happy you're here. Before I get started on my presentation, I have to acknowledge that we have a very, very special guest uh, tuning in this evening. His name is Jim Poole. And Jim is one of the foremost uh, local historians for all of Poolsville, specializing in the Civil War. But not only is he a, a well self-educated man in the, in the matters of the Civil War in Poolsville, he's very talented. If you've been into the John Poole House, you, you would have seen some of his paintings of Poolsville during the Civil War. You may have seen the model uh, uh, John Poole House that he built with his own hand and, and, and other things. And so, Jim, uh, I'm glad to see you here. I I'm, didn't see your video, so but I hope you're feeling good and you're doing good. And thanks for being here, Jim. Well, again, let me start right from the beginning. We're going to talk to you this evening. Uh, we're going to, uh, on the on many celebrations that Poolsville has had a history of, we, we feature Poolsville Day a lot in today's uh, uh, discussions. After all, we're talking about the 27th annual Poolsville Day. And that is a, a major achievement. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a great organization. I, you know, I was on the board of that for eight years. Um, and I, I rose to the high rank in the Pool of the Bay Committee as, as being the official porta potty coordinator. And that, you know, that, that was a very high honor for me. <laughs> they gave me a t shirt and everything. And, and so, but there's so much more to, to Pools of the Bay. And I, I want to make that clear because a lot of times we forget how. Poolsville has always been Poolsville. It's always been a, a community-oriented town. And so I'm going to talk about some major events. Uh, as I teased the event, I said, you know, Poolsville Day is a great day. But back in the 30s, they had a festival that lasted three days with two shows and evening shows and an afternoon show, what I'm going to get into in, in just a little bit. But, um, and, you know, things in Poolsville really started getting going in around 1843 when the, uh, when the agricultural fair was brought into Poolsville for the first time. And then in 1945, when the modern day uh, Montgomery County Agri uh, Fair uh, was organized uh, in Rockville, uh, they selected Poolsville also as their site to begin uh, that. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to pick up a little bit with uh, post uh, Post-Civil War, I'm going to talk about a gentleman we, we talked about the last time, my favorite history character of all time for Pulso, Uncle Waddy Owens. If you were with me the last time, you'll recall that he was um, a slave who Abraham Lincoln uh, actually gave him a horse to help him out in a special situation. I don't want to really go into that now. But he also loved to talk about he loved to sing in church and he talked about Saturday nights in Poolsville. People would come in the town, people were on the porches, they would be in the streets, they would be talking to one another. Uh, often singing would break out and even more often dancing. So even when it wasn't a formal event, the uh, community had a way of just, you know, gathering up uh, uh, a community sense. And, um, and of course, uh, most of the, um, organized events back in those days would have been centered from the various churches. And, um, and over the years, a major form of entertainment and community gathering was always dances. They had a lot of dances uh, at the thrift shop in town. That was a dance hall. And um, you had the uh, charity hall out in Dickerson uh, that you've just seen recently. They restored the, uh, they, I shouldn't say restored, but they've renovated uh, their uh, charity hall, which was a dance hall too. So getting together as a, as a, a community was something very, very um, big. In fact, it even when I, when I first came to Poolsville, um, we came in 1976 and we bought a townhouse on Cohost Road. And uh, it was an end unit with a fireplace for $39,600 in 1976. It might interest some people to know what they were going for when they were brand new. But, you know, it, it typical of a life in pools as a small community, young people, young children, first homers, we often got together a lot and we had and, and, and we, we developed something that we called a SPAD. And it was um, and what SPAD was the initials for was a spontaneous party at the Davises. And I'm proud of that achievement. And 
And so parties and getting together, as I said, is, is has always been uh, part of the heart and soul of Poolville. It, uh, they really try to uh, involve everyone. The first uh, major event outside of the Saturdays and dances and, and after the Civil War, I'm gonna talk about occurred in the 1930s. And it was in the 1930s that traveling Chautauquas became very popular. Now Chautauqua comes from the county, Chautauqua County, which is the furthest, most Western county in upstate New York, all the way at the South. And there, there was an institute called the Chautauqua the uh, Chautauqua Institute, and they specialized in entertainment, musical presentations, serious lectures and stuff. And the Chautauqua, and, and people would travel to Chautauqua to attend these events. And then like circuses and everything else, they stumbled on the idea of, of a huge tent. They would start in traveling. So in our area, it was the Radcliffe Chautauqua. And the man was W.H. Radcliffe out of Washington, D.C. And he, he is the person who was the promoter of this traveling festival of music and recreation and inspiration. Now, it, when they would come into town, they'd set their tent up just about where the Baptist church is today. And I, I, when I first wrote about it in a mystery history, I, I noted how intriguing it was that the church was built on a lot that had a history of, of singing and song and and get togethers. So they set up a tent. Now for three days, you for two dollars, you could attend all the events, um, afternoon and evening for three days, or you could attend them individually for 75 cents. Now an afternoon performance usually started with a serious lecture and then ended, I'm sorry, we would start with music. Or I got that wrong. Yeah, we would start with music and entertainment and it would end with a lecture. But that reversed at night. They started with a serious uh, lecture. Now, I suppose that's because they're afraid people might leave if they and not wait around for the serious lecture after the entertainment in the evening. I don't know. But uh, some of these lectures that they had, some of the topics that a speaker would speak about was one was that's something within, or broken barriers, or the end of the rainbow. One speaker talked about a better tomorrow or the dawn of civilization. So these were very serious lectures. Now I'm gonna show you, see if I can do this. I hope everybody can, you're not gonna see this clearly. We're gonna go through these individuals. I'm gonna bring it back. And this is a copy, a small copy of what would have been a wall poster that would have been put up all over town promoting the Radcliffe Chautauqua with all the events and all the things that you can see. Individually, the Radcliffe Chautauqua promoted the fact that they had a bevy of beautiful young ladies who would be the hostesses for the evening, answering your questions, guiding you around, and making sure that you were, were happy at each event. The highlight of the show, the star of the show, and someone that the Methodist Church would be thrilled about because her name was Edith Clark. Edith Marshall Clark. I, don't, if you can, I hope everyone can see that. I'll try to hold it up right there and try to hold it steady. She's the Chautauqua's leading lady, and she played what was called a beautiful silver toned Swiss handbells. So uh, the, the tradition of handbell music in Pulso started there, and now we have the Methodist Church having their wonderful uh, bell choir that performs on occasion for the public and, of course, at the church all the time. But she was considered the star of the show, but I think it's because, as you know, her name is uh, Edith Clark, and all the entertainment was brought to you by something called the Clark Company. <laughs> and so I think that's why they made her the star. But they also had people like this young lady who the pro they always offered programs in readings and soprano and cello soloists, xylophone selections, and what they called the fascinating musical liar. I don't know, can you see that? If someone can 
advise me am i holding that steady enough do i need to yeah we can see can it you see that one off? now that's the liar and so she would play that that would be part of it one of the most popular groups at the chautauqua when it came to entertainment was the plymouth male quartet and these guys played instruments they they sang with uh, what they called well blended voices and they did impersonation. They said they sang all the popular standard hits of the day. And they did impersonations of famous singers, solos. They did instruments and all the special features. But they would perform and they were very popular and they would be part of and they would show, you know, and they may not play every day. Some of these would play some in uh, days or others, but then they would also have theater. And this group is called the Sprague, the Sprague Players. It features actor Herbert Sprague. They build themselves as an all-star cast of actors. And they presented a play, a one-act play called The Duel. And that was an artistic rendition of Washington Irving's Rip Van Winkle. If you look carefully at this, and I don't know if you can tell, uh, the, the gentleman on the far end there with a the long beard would have been Rip Van Winkle. So they had plays and they had musical content, uh, things like that. Give you an idea of, of some of the serious lectures that would come along. This gentleman, his name is E. F. Fakar. Now he's a professor of literature at the University of Kentucky. He was billed as an excellent speaker. And I love the way they put this. He was an excellent speaker who has something to say and knows how to say it. <laughs> that was, that's what his billing was. I don't know if he was a true Tony Robbins of his day or not. Another speaker on the uh, Puzo Radical Chicago was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Albert Marion Hyde. And he was considered a great lecturer who has spoken before hundreds of Chautauqua audiences in practically every state. So they were letting you know that this serious professor was also nationally known. The last speaker was Dr. Daniel Martin. And he was also billed as an eloquent speaker who handles his subjects with more than the usual brilliance and clarity of thought. That's what the poster would tell you. Now, I'm going to talk to Dots Elgin about the event. She would tell me that her favorite act of all was a dancer. She loved the dancing. And she said they did the Can Can, they did the Charleston, they had the, all the right costumes. And, uh, and so she really loved those events more than uh, anything else. But that would be a, a three day festival in the 1930s. Also in the 30s, um, a festival that was very popular in Poolsville was May Day. Of course, it was all over the world. Uh, May 1st used to be Maypoles. I don't know how people, have, most of you probably have at least heard of Maypoles. I don't know if we've had a Maypole celebration, uh, but they, they were big in, in Poolsville during the 30s. And, uh, you know, the, the kids really loved it. They'd get together, as you can see, and they would create the maypole. They'd sing and dance around that. Another, another one I'll show you right here. But May Day also included a parade in town. Kids would be in their special costumes and floats and be in the parade. All the young ladies dressed up in their best clothes, best costumes. Can we see that okay still? All right. Yes. 
Good, thank you. And then everybody would join in and parade to town, to the center of town. And that's when the speeches and the other presentations would be brought out. So May Day was a very popular thing. Uh, some people will tell you, I don't know if it's true or not, May Day went, went um, on the wayside because it became a major festival among the communist countries. And so it wasn't popular anymore in America. And they focused on Labor Day when it came to things of that celebratory nature. So if I don't lose my place too much, like anyone else, I had to super organize and then look all these pictures. Get it a little bit thing. 1945, as I mentioned, um, uh, Montgomery County Fair organized in Rockville. They brought the county fair out here. Now, the next next big event in Poolsville is when I get a big thrill out of it because. It was a celebration of the 150th anniversary of Poolsville. And you may be surprised that I mentioned that in a historical sense because we just had this great, wonderful celebration in Poolsville. But this was different. It was based on the reported post office opening in 1804. And I kind of trust that figure because the, the notion of uh, Poolsville Day celebration of the 150th anniversary would have come from Charles Elgin, who was the postmaster in Poolsville before he was a longtime mayor. And Charles, he would have been right that the post office was uh, first initiated in 1804. And I say it that way because I read historical accounts that say it was 1810. Um, but I, I would trust the 1804 more than the 1810. Our first postmaster, one of our first postmaster was Dennis Lacklin. And Dennis was an assistant to John Poole Jr., who eventually took over the John Poole trading post when John Poole Jr. and his wife Priscilla uh, left and, and moved out to her family farm in, in Barnesville. And uh, I always joke that it didn't take him long to run the, the business out of business, but. Uh, uh, I think the truth is that the, the pool boys from the Bill family started another uh, trading post on the corner over there where the barbershop now is. And I think they probably did a better job and that was his problem. But, you know, back in 1804, the mail would come in at Poolville from Rockville. And if you've been to the John Pool House, you may be familiar with the fact that they have straps at the, on the fireplace mantle. And it is there that letters would be tucked under these straps. And so when you came in to buy things or have coffee or, you know, socialize at the John Poole Trading Post, you would look for your mail and that also outgoing mail. So sometimes when people were traveling to Rockville, they would pick up the mail from Poolsville and take it down. The first or coming, if they were down in Rockville and coming into Poolsville, they would bring the, the mail. But they did have a mailman and he was paid $75 a year. Uh, to bring, um, part of his job was to bring the, the mail to uh, Poolsville. And so in 18, in 1954, they had the first Poolsville sesquicentennial. Now here's an amazing thing, I think. For a town less than 400 people, the newspaper reports for that festival said there was over or was up to 3,000 people in the streets. They brought them in from all over to celebrate uh, this great day. Now, Poolsville looked a lot like it did to does today, but it was different. And so the downtown in 1953 or 1954 in Poolsville would look like this. That, that uh, horizontal brick building is where Bassett's is now. Let me just see something. I believe it, at that time it was uh, Bet Betty's, um, Titus's tasty cupboard, 
But that building is an interesting historical building because it not only had a diner, but at one time had a dry cleaner. The post office was also in that building one time. At another time, um, it was a flower shop. Our first pizza for Poolville came in a restaurant called Larry's. But that would have been the, the downtown Poolville the day before the big celebration. The event was held in August of 1954. This is, this is gonna be a newspaper picture I'm gonna show you. It's gonna be hard to tell exactly, I think. But you can see, it looks, you can see the crowd. It's like one of our Pools of Day pictures of today. Okay, it shows a crowd of people in downtown. Downtown Pool at this stage, of course, is up by the Old Town Hall. And the lead wagon that you have front is a stagecoach. And the second one right behind them is uh, more of a pioneer's uh, kind of wagon. The theme for the day was Pioneer Days. I want to present this picture. This is going to be another hard picture to see, but I just want to do this because this gentleman really deserves to be mentioned. And, and he's in, in this picture, you're going to see he's really... He's about 83 years old in that picture, and he's leading the Poolsville Band. And that band, in 1950, this is 1954, he started at 25 years before that, but he actually became a band director at the age of 19, and he's 83 in this picture. And we talk about a community facility here in the high school and things like that. I'm hoping that one of the things that will come out of uh, our new high school and, and, and a community facility that we can use. I will, I'm kind of hoping that the pools will go back to its roots and establish a real community band. Now the one, the band that we see a lot in their white uniforms was actually made, most of those members were family members and people from Dickerson, uh, but it was called the Poolville Band and uh, they used to have a lot of concerts out by Linden Farms on Martinsburg Road. Uh, there was a bandstand there and they did a lot of performances there. And talk about restoring a band to Poolville. This next picture. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Poolville High School Marching Band of 1954. It's something we don't even have at Poolville High School. There's no I don't know, it's been quite a few years since there was a marching band. I, I think it was about five or six years ago when they got a new music director, he discovered they had all these beautiful band uniforms hanging around and he forced them to march in Poolsdale Parade. I remember going over to the parade and this marching band of students was there and I couldn't, get, I couldn't believe it. And who are they and where are they? Well, they said, it's Poolsville. And I was shocked and as it turned out, he got the uniforms out and he forced uh, his students to march in the pool of the day parade at, in the band uniforms. And uh, he pretty much got fired for that. Too many parents uh, objected to the fact that he forced them to do so. And he was gone. He was there one year. So that's as close as we have gotten to having a Poolville marching band. We have grand marshals. We have award winners. Well, the winner of the 1954 float was Jack Hickman, I believe it's Hickman or Hackman, I have to look that up. But he's the driver of the stagecoach. You can see him here. And he took first place. He had a bevy of local celebrities that he drove in the parade. Like, not surprisingly, the, the parade route was about a mile long. And he took first place. It was always, uh, people got dressed up for events. They got up in a big way. And this is, <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Right? <laughs> All right, look at these beautiful ladies. Now, if you're from Poolsville, you see two ladies here. One's got a feather in a hat, the other does not. I'm telling you, most of you people know the woman without the feather. Does anybody want to guess who that woman is? 
Yeah, I don't know how you do that. Well, I'll tell you what her name was on August 26, 1954. That woman without the feather and hat <laughs> was Betty Jean Wynn. You know her as Betty Jean Selby. How beautiful, huh? So you all got into that day big time. You know, if you go through Poolsville High School yearbooks, um, their newsletters, their student newspapers, you'll learn that in the 30s and 40s, one of the most popular things for students to do is write poetry, poems to each other, poems about what's going on, whimsical poems. And um, so for the 1954 sesquicentennial, someone by the name of Folger, Folger McKinney. He called himself the Benttown Bard, wrote a poem about Poolsville. And so on the cover of the program for Poolsville Day 1954 is that poem. And I'm gonna read it. Not far away, old sugar loaf rears lofty to the skies and through Montgomery's rolling fields, the voice of beauty flies. Not far away, Potomac flows and the old canals asleep and every garden has a rose and here the old dreams creep. Old churches, gentle memories, schools, stores, and overall, the fragrance of the old estates with stained ivied wall, phantoms of wars long fought and done. The sabers gleam, the shot, and shadows of old village folk. None ever have forgot. O oh, village, mid the miles of wheat, the corn, the rye, and the grass, no longer through ancient, no longer through your ancient road, the lumbering coaches pass. But ever looking down on you, the mountains guard your rest, sweet Poolsville, with a rose to dream upon you're quiet, yes. So, Puzzle has its own poem. I'm gonna pause here to see if anyone has any questions. No questions, okay. Well, what I thought was gonna take a lot longer, I guess I kind of blew, blew through pretty easy here, so it's not gonna be a long night for you. But I will say the most amusing thing for me is a newspaper clipping I ran across. And I'll show you the headline and the article really speaks about it. But this is a, a newspaper showing Poolsville on May 26, 1941. It's not the picture that uh, interests me as much. It's probably one you've seen before. What interests me is the article. The article was about the incorporation of Poolsville in 1888 by the Maryland State Legislature. So you know what this means. <laughs> it means we're gonna have a third sesquicentennial in the year 2038 because it'll be 150 years since uh, in 1867, we got a charter. In 1888, we got incorporated. And so I'm hoping that we kept some of the banners for the 150th, some of those signs, and we won't have to print as many. But that, uh, the point that I would make of all is that you can tell that, that, that as a community, getting together is a big part of Poolsville. And we should be proud of Poolsville Day. And, uh, I'm thrilled that uh, the Poolsville Day Committee 
uh, is back um, and they, they're planning for September 18 this year. And at this point, uh, they're moving ahead with it. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, as we all are, that um, continued success with the vaccine and other items will bring us to a point where we can have another pool of the day and, and then start to carry on. We never had uh, things like what we're going through in the entire history of the town. It's, that's the first. And so that would be my uh, discussion this evening about Poolsville and, and their celebrations. I hope that uh, you found it interesting. I hope you uh, uh, welcome it as part of your heritage now. And when people ask you to participate in community events, you, you willingly uh, step forward. I, uh, okay, and that would be my presentation tonight, uh, Dottie. I so now, if you'd like to ask questions, everyone, I think this would be a good time to unmute and do so or send them in the chat. Um, our first question from the chat is, what was the date on Betty Jean Selby's photo, if you know? Oh, that would have been in 1954. They, they just stopped. She, yeah, Betty is what? She's in her 80s today, 83. She probably is, um, I would guess, a sophomore in, in high school in that picture. But I'm, I'm just guessing. Are there copies of the Poolsville Bulletin online anywhere, like the copies of your paper are? Oh, yeah. I, I have buckets of them. I don't know if, uh, you know, every monocle is online. I don't know if you're aware of that. We go all the way back to March of 2004, and you can actually reread every monocle online and click on it and, and read the actual newspaper. Uh, but I, I've had hundreds of them, uh, the bulletins. Uh, interestingly about the bulletin, I admire how the, the first editions of the, the bulletin were really a community oriented uh, newspaper. Gene Helmus was a publisher, Stan Janet was part of that. And it was only in later years that um, it got away from uh, I think it's an original mission of trying to uplift the community and, and foster a community spirit and got, eh, for my butt, a little bit too, a little bit too political. Randy, are these pictures from a collection of your, of yours, or where did, where did you acquire these various pictures? Most of these pictures are from Dots Elgin. Mm, okay. I I've taken a lot of this and a lot of, I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you, one of the greatest um, honors and pleasures of, of having a newspaper for the last uh, 16 years is getting to meet these uh, centennial, uh, the, the, the senior seniors of our community. And Dots was one of my closest friends. I used to bring the paper to her every issue, right to her kitchen. Uh, and we would chat and talk about things. And so she was always um, outspoken and and, and fun to talk to. And so uh, that's where uh, my source for most of this information is. Uh, you know, it's, I'd, I spent hours and, you know, going through her scrapbooks, taking the pictures that you see here of the scrapbook. There's more, I mean, and now they're all transferred. I have most of her scrapbooks on my computer. And so most of the, we're not gonna run out of mystery histories. I, <laughs> I have not been writing as many mystery histories as I have in the past. Um, We've brought in some more writers. John does a lot of Civil War stuff and Canal stuff, and so that's history. And Jack Toomey does, he's done local history. So we have various, and we, we love to do the fillers, uh, the Minoxi moments, the Minoxi lost in time or the then and now kind of thing. So there's always a lot of history in, 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 uh, in the monocle. And, uh, uh, when I conceived of the column mystery history, what I was trying to center on is a history in the town that most people don't know about. It's not the kind of thing that you drive down the road and there'd be a marker on the road saying, if, if they got a marker on the side of the road, that would not be a mystery history for me. It would be something that happened that is almost legendary. And it's just talked about, you know, like a, a plane crash uh, over Poolsville and the pilot bails out and ends up dangling from a tree on Peachtree Road. Uh, those kind of uh, 
events that uh, have occurred. But uh, that's where I get my, my information. And, and, and I'm not gonna claim that everything that, that is in these newspaper reports is accurate either, because uh, I, like I said, I've, I've seen things that I have to question myself. Uh, the, one of the gentlemen who could correct anything I said tonight is listening tonight. So I, I'm, I'm hoping he's gonna be quiet, be quiet. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I would welcome him uh, uh, to, to say hello to everybody because this community owes an awful lot to that man. You know, that, that town hall is loaded with a lot of Civil War artifacts and it can be a, we had it set up, as you know, I was on the board for I don't, nine, 10 years. I was the executive director of HMD and we had set it up as a, as a museum. But all those artifacts are, are things that, that Jim found that he dug up in the, uh, he, he often used to portray um, a medical officer. Not so much anymore, probably, because it was a Confederate <laughs> medical officer. But uh, Jim, I'm just so glad you're here. Any other questions there? Yeah, our next question from the chat is, when did the Poolsville Community Fairs begin? These were the ones that were held at the high school. They were great fun. When did the fairs begin? Like yes, you talking the about like Poolsville a, Community Fairs that were at the high school. Oh, well, I, I know that they had them in, in 1976. When I first moved, they had fairs at the, in the gymnasium at the high school. But they would be just, you know, they were fairs, but they weren't the, uh, uh, the county fairs. Now, the fairs that I'm talking about are the ag, you know, where the, where, what's, it's a fair that really features uh, 4-H uh, livestock, the, the, the achievements of young people in 4-H, uh, everybody would bring their best pigs, their best animals. Uh, you know, in 1843, uh, when the, the fair was first brought out here, one of the categories in 1843 was tobacco was judged. And um, that was a cash crop. And we used to have a, a swath of uh, tobacco hanging in the John Poole house because it was a cash crop uh, for the people living out here. Um, as I always explain to the young folks when they come in, that tobacco is as bad on the land as it is on your lungs, and it, it, it just sapped the, the nutrients out of the land, and so they couldn't continue with tobacco, and they switched a, a number of different other um, crops, but uh, tobacco played a big part of our economy, and, uh, you know, I mentioned in the um, last uh, seminar how John Poole Jr., was it was entitled as a factor he was his official position and was not just running a trading post but he was also a factor and that meant that when there was dispute over trades because of, there wasn't as much cash purchases uh in the area and so people traded and uh, often uh, there would be disputes on to what is the right value and and they had to have someone to settle the dispute who's going to make this judgment and John Poole Jr. was a highly esteemed individual in the town. He was a lay leader in St. Peter's Church. He was a, a Eucharistic minister. When, uh, when the priests weren't here, he would often uh, handle the morning prayer type of services. He read the, uh, the, um, the gospel, I mean, not the gospel, but the lessons of the day uh, at the church. And so he was well-respected in town. I, I remember when I started portraying my and I, I got this triangle hat and it's, it, you know, I'm being kind of, I know that I'm portraying him somewhat inaccurately because he must have been a better dressed man than I portray him because he was a, a leader in the town at, at the time. Um, but yeah, the high school uh, had uh, different fairs. You know, we've done a lot of different things. We had business fairs every year for many years in town and more recently. Um, the chamber would sponsor those, um, but um, that's kind of fallen on the way too. Uh, more recently, that and that's fallen away even before the COVID uh, situation. But um, just as long as we, we we don't get so full of what we're doing and, and focus on pools of day so much, we forget that this is who we are and this is where we come from. Were there newspapers before the bulletin? 
not not in Poolsville. I mean, the Centennial is. Jim probably could rattle us off, but the cent Montgomery County Centennial it still an exist, I think, and it's it went back into the eighteen. I'm going to guess 1850s, but it, it's it, it's been around for a long time. Yeah, we think we've you know well in this day and age of print, we think making 16 years is pretty monumental <laughs> achievement. It's getting harder. I'm, we're about to put out the smallest paper we put out in years this next issue. So, but we're going to keep doing it. It'll happen, and uh, things will turn around. I think for sure. Our next question says, Randy, a little off of tonight's subject, but could you let me know how the name was arrived at for Partnership Road? No, how Partnership Road got named? Yes. That's the question. You know, I did hear that one time, uh, or at least the theory. Uh, I'm going to open this question up to Jim. And, and Jim, if you're there and you know the answer, could you uh, give her that answer? Apparently not. No, I, I don't. We do have a feature in the monocle called Streetwise. And we talk about why each name of a, a street. And we've gone through and done a number of them. Okay. Fisher Avenue was, uh, uh, the Fisher Farm was on the street. Uh, and um, it wasn't, a, the main road in the pool, though, as most of you probably are aware, uh, wasn't Fisher Avenue. It was um, what was called Conrad. Road. And um, I'm not Conrad. Coxon, Coxon Road. And that's the road I live on. That's, a, that's the road Town Hall is on. And right now, today, it's a very short, about 100 yard road. But uh, as you came into Poolsville um, from the south, in fact, today, when you come into Poolsville, you get a, about a mile outside of Poolsville, and all of a sudden, you have this incredibly radical left hand turn. Yeah, also, there it is. And what's ahead? Nothing. There's not a mountain. There's not a river. There's not rocks. There's nothing that says you shouldn't be going straight. And originally, the road would have gone straight, and it curved into Poolsville and, and came into town right in front of my house, right in front of the town hall, went right into the center of town, past the John Poole house, and ended right where it does today. However, it also flooded, and it always flooded. And in, 18, in the 1840s uh, is when they they changed the road and opened up Fisher Avenue, which was, um, it wasn't just flooding though. Uh, you know, value of property was, could be well determined if you lived on the main street. And so there was a lot of political pressure to, to for the people living up on the, that area of the town to have that road changed. But it was a smart decision because even before the town hall was built and we first moved into our house here, uh, on, on uh, Bell Street. Uh, it used to flood in the field, in the park, all the time. In fact, uh, there was a nice family of ducks that used to live there because there's so much collection of water. So I, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Partnership was named that because everybody owed money to the bank. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's what I was always told. Okay, is this uh, Jim? Who's talking? Jim Pole. Okay, Jim. All right. Yeah, that's because they call them subscriptions, they call them partnerships. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, original. I can't remember the original name, but it was another road in Montgomery County that had the same name, so they had to change it. Okay, now that's the man, folks. Okay, don't let anybody kid you. There's a lot of us pretenders all over town, but that's the true historian for Pulsa. Trust me. Uh, thank you, Jim. I really appreciate. You know, helping me out there because I, I that sounds like what I had heard something like that too, you know, but uh, but we've done a lot of the um, you know street names and we'll continue to do so. We, we'd like to do more, but you know, biweekly, how often can you do them? Do we have any more questions? <laughs> Well, that's All not, right. I made <laughs> ten minutes. I made fifty minutes, and that wasn't as, that worked out. Thanks for the questions. Give me a little bit more legs. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Yeah, it was fun. I hope you enjoyed it, yeah, and I hope yeah. you enjoy reading the monocle. We continue to try to bring as much uh, interesting local history as we can, as often as we can. 